So <laughs> very, very quickly, um, I had always, when I was at university, my roommates were engineers and they made loads of fun um, of me because every legal book that they saw did not even have a single picture on it, including on the cover. And so my presentation will have a few pictures because I'm trying to overcompensate for all the fun they made, made of me. Now, the picture that you're looking at now, I took this picture at Pall Mall. I was walking home and London over, over Christmas has beautiful, beautiful, some of the most exquisite um, Christmas light displays. And while walking past, you know, I was thinking about global disparities in energy con consumption. And right now, for example, the light that you're using now is possibly sourced from nuclear power. The company or the country that is heavily reliant on nuclear power is France. And EDF um, is the company in this country, at least, that supplies energy from nuclear power. They source their uranium from Niger and Kazakhstan. To just give you an example of how different um, the energy consumption patterns are, the whole of Niger consumes annually 190 megawatts of electricity, the whole country. To just compare that, the only nuclear facility that I've ever visited is the Tornes power plant in Scotland. And the Tornes power plant produces 1,190 megawatts. To put it differently so that you contextualize this, an American fridge, the average American fridge consumes 459, um, 400, around 459 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. This is roughly nine times what the, the whole of Ethiopia um, consumes per year, an Ethiopian household in a year. To put it differently, the Cowboys Stadium, if you put a meter outside the Cowboys Stadium, during game time, it would consume as much, if not more, electricity than the whole country of Liberia. And so when we think about energy systems, it is, they're not just local problems, they're global problems, and you have global value chains. Now, Niger, which supplies um, uranium to France, which then supplies us with this power, the price of uranium had not changed between 1975 and 2013. Niger does not have nuclear power themselves. And so there are many things to think about when you think of global energy systems, when you think of technology, and when you think of international law. Now this is, we've already begun with the introduction, so um, we we'll look at energy, technology, and the law, and not spend too much time on, on that, because a lot of people have mentioned how technology and law intersect. I'll then explain what the energy dilemma is, we shall look at constraints in international energy law. Um, we are in, in the environmental panel, so we'll look at sustainability. And then I'll conclude on that sober note. Now, we've already had an introduction. I had that picture because it's a wonderful um, conversation starter. We live in a wonderful world where we can have some of the most exquisite Christmas lighting, and a short flight where I'm from, I'm originally from Kenya. I was driving through, I want, don't want to call it a wilderness, but through a game reserve. And I saw a herd of elephants and a man walking among them. Now, if you know anything about East Africa, we do not domesticate wild animals. So this was quite bizarre. So I, I stopped. I did not get out of the car. I asked the guy, may I please come out? Will I die? And I've cropped him out for dramatic effect. He's standing right next to me. Um, so the only reason I was able to do this, this is a wild elephant. Apparently he, he took care of this elephant when it was young and they apparently have very good memory. And so when the elephant was released into the wild and it was older, it's never forgotten him. So that's how he's able to walk into the wild and walk about. And that's how I was able to take this picture. It has nothing to do with my presentation today, but it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just to show that we live in a world where we can have that and we can have that on the same planet and therefore we really must think of sustainable uses of energy if we are to coexist on this planet now the intersection between energy innovation and the law i'll not spend too much time what i would invite you to do is to look at your program what technology does is that it identifies and generates problems if you read any of the presentation you'll see 
numerous problems that technology um, provides. You look at solutions that technology provides as well. You look at specific detail on these issues. And what's clearly becoming um, obvious now is that the role of technology in law and the role of technology, energy and law are becoming part of public discourse. Then it's not just a few geeks sitting in a room. There's numerous, like blockchain is an example where there's blockchain in energy, blockchain and voting, blockchain and banking. And so energy has traditionally been associated with technology and modern life from the discovery of fire through to the use of mills in, you know, in, in the agrarian revolution. If you look at the industrial revolution and the use of fossil fuels, whatever we call modern life has been spurred by energy. Now, so what's the intersection between energy innovation and the law? This picture, um, I took this picture from my sister's office or the MV. Look at that view. So this is one of the busiest intersections in Nairobi. And I just thought it would be a good picture for me to just demonstrate that. Now, what are the opportunities we have in terms of technology and what are the challenges that we have between technology, energy, and the law? Now, if you've attended any of the other sessions, there are numerous applications that could be there that technology offers um, in energy systems. And then these opportunities present various problems. Blockchain is an example, um, and you know when you think of blockchain and the applications that could be there, it, it has the power to decentralize energy systems. It has the power, you know, to have real-time energy transactions. It has the power to eliminate the middleman, so to speak. And so, the question that the questions that we're asking here is: Does the rate of technological development? exceed or supersede the development of the law? And what are the implications in the energy sector? Now, there could be energy system transformation, and this is co completely tied with sustainability, and I'll demonstrate that as I explain what the energy dilemma is. Because when you think of big data, for example, you can have huge data sets and the ability to, to synthesize some, some, some of these data to generate solutions in energy systems. For example, I mean, um, using big data, you could have energy efficiency um, mechanisms. You could have smart meters. You could monitor how, how, how expensive electricity is. You could switch on certain appliances in your home, and that's just on the personal front. Now, if you think o on a more industrial scale, I mean, there could be balancing of, of the electric grid. There could be decentralization of the electric grid, and so on. And so when you think of clean energy technology, for example, solar power is one of the examples where in, and I found this quite fascinating, the company that actually pioneered solar power was an oil company. I believe it was ExxonMobil that in the 50s and 60s that thought, you know, during the age of the space race, they thought, look, how can we power um, with something that's disconnected from the earth. And they thought, you know, solar panels would work. Because the, it was not commercially viable at the time, solar power was not commercialized. And this is one of the other things that we we'll look at. What are the other influences, apart from just technology, that stop or hinder the adaptation of what people call disruptive or revolutionary technologies in energy systems? And what is the role of the law, and in particular international law, in all of this? Now, it is essential to have enhanced communication and research using technology. Because part of the biggest problem that we have is a disconnect between how law is communicated and how technology is communicated. There appears to be a disconnect. When people bandy around certain words, it is unclear what they actually mean. And then, and one of the things, as I'll demonstrate in, in in the slides that are coming, is that this disconnect then affects, one, the development of the law, but secondly, it hinders energy systems from functioning effectively and stops the development of energy technologies. Now, in terms of energy law, technology has the function of promoting energy law and disseminating energy law, whether you think of you know, new media, whether you think of social media, whether you think of research. I remember when I started as, as an intern in the law firm, one of the main tasks of an intern was to do research. And research entailed walking into a library, 
you know, looking at law reports, writing briefs. And what would be a day's work then is essentially a matter of seconds now on, on a portal. And so specific to energy law, um, energy law started, and uh, in particular, international energy law, the scholarship on international energy law started about um, 20 years ago in 1996. By the, uh, there was a seminal pa paper. And now, between 20 years ago and now, there's been an acceleration of energy scholarship with technology. And so you look with you know, um, better ways of legal research, there has been dissemination of international energy law principles. There's monitoring of compliance um, globally. There's investigative abilities um, wh when you think of technology. And there's the evidentiary value um, that technology gives to energy law. Now, I come from a country where we have some of the most flamboyant preachers. And they've mastered the art of concentration. So whenever there's a session, um, concentration is a you. At the beginning when someone's starting, people are focused. And then a few minutes in, you know, the concentration dips. Someone wonders, you know, you go on Facebook, you wonder whether you left the kettle on, you chat to someone. And then when you hear finally, your concentration peaks. And so these preachers, what they do is they say finally about 10 times in the course of their presentation. And so if I say finally more than once, please forgive me. Um, and anyway, so I'll not say my first finally there. But if you look at financial motivations, if you look at the financial motivations in energy systems, it very quickly takes us to what the energy trilemma is. Now, the energy trilemma has been, most people are familiar with what a dilemma is, which is basically having two options that are really, really difficult to make a decision on. Now, in, in energy systems, the World Energy Council came up with the energy trilemma, which is the measure of sustainability in energy systems. So if you pick any energy source, say coal, you, there are three measures with which you see how sustainable energy systems can be. So the first one is economics. Is it affordable? Um, is it cheap? And does it have financing? Then there's politics. And politics in energy systems means security of supply. Um, bodies like the European Union were formed actually to secure energy supply. So it started as the coal and steel union. And so when you think of politics, the question is, is this energy reliable? And then when you think of the environment as a driver, is it clean? Um, do you, uh, what are the emissions uh, that are coming from it? And so if you think of any energy resource and you place it there, coal is dirty and therefore fails the environmental um, st um, standard. It is cheap, so it might fit in the economics and it is available in some regions. And you can throw in whichever energy resource you think about. But then if we elevate this into the international forum, then you have to start thinking, what does the energy mix look like? And so whenever you think of energy systems, this is possibly the most succinct um, definition of global energy problems. And how does technology solve this? Now, there are constraints to the law, which I shall just say, put it this way. There's a fragmented legal framework for international energy law. And since there is not a central overarching law and, it's all, and the law is all over the place, it means that the regulation of the law and the management of energy resources is not um, effective at the moment. Now, this what is what is called the Unsettle um, um, Solar Farm in Plymouth. Now, what was really strange about this is that the four days that we spent there we did not see the sun and we were speaking about solar technology. And this is what technology can actually do, that you can have in the, in the southwest of the United Kingdom, a solar farm that pro actually provides solar power without actually having the sun. And there are disruptive qualities of, of this sort of thing because in the UK, these are people who are actually connected to the national grid, but it's a community solar project that's providing power um, to, to the national grid and changing the lives of people around there. Now, I think I have about two minutes, so I'll just focus on the first one. And whenever we think of sustainability and whenever we think of carbon emissions, there are two things you need to think about. 66% of global emissions are traceable to the energy industry, and therefore energy and environment are inseparable. But whenever people do most of their analysis, they really look at emissions from governments. 
But there's this paper that says two thirds of global emissions, actually it's about 63%, are traced to 90 companies. And therefore, if international law regulated these companies properly, we might not really need to focus on country um, emissions. And part of the problem in international law and in international energy law in particular is the focus on the state as the central actor. Now, what are the other challenges? Um, so I took that picture um, from off the back of a transformer and I found it quite funny because it was raining, we were standing right next to the transformer and there was this glaring sign saying, we might die there. Almost to my finally, what are the other challenges between energy, technology, and law? Context and communication are key. I started this, um, this same forum and we were speaking about clean energy. And one person, it, it appeared to me that they were at cross purpose. So when I asked each one of them, one was a community leader from an informal settlement in South Africa, and the other one was an energy developer from the UK. And when I asked them what their understanding of clean energy was, the person from, from the community in South Africa was speaking about, about non-smoky stoves, you know, power within their house. The person in the UK, when they spoke of clean energy, was actually thinking about climate change. And so one of the key things is to look at the energy system, not just from a production or a consumption perspective, but to have a cradle to the grave perspective from extraction, like I mentioned, Niger and the mines to production, to consumption, to decommissioning and waste disposal. Once we have holistic views of energy systems, then perhaps we might deal with the problem of sustainability better. Now, technology agnosticism comes in where people are not connected to electricity. Someone just needs clean power in the house. They really do not care whether it's from coal or from renewable energy resources if they're disconnected. And to just give you an idea of why this is a problem, one billion people in the world do not have modern energy services. 2.7 billion use smoky biomass in, in enclosed spaces to, for heating and cooking. Now, 95% the, of these people are in sub-Saharan Africa and developing Asia, and now they're being connected to electricity. So we are looking at emissions that are going to grow exponentially unless we invest in renewable energy technologies and have sustainable energy resources. So what are the possibilities? Um, the possibilities are up there. We might speak about them if you have any questions. Um, I have zero minutes left. And on that sober note, I think we need to promote an overarching international energy law build global frameworks and institutions. It is essential to have interdisciplinary um, connection because it is the only way with, with which the next two things will happen. We, when, when you look at energy systems, everyone's speaking about making energy systems smarter, you know, having smart meters, uh, upgrading the grid. But one of the things that I propose is that it's important to have international cooperation to make energy law and policy less dumb. Thank you very much.